example, as I said, 58 years since I first encountered a large, loose-limbed young priest who was also then beginning his first years in college as a maths teacher. But his benign, relaxed manner and his clear, candid, jolly God accent have stayed with me ever since. His voice was like a welcome to algebra and geometry. It felt like an earnest of potential in those subjects, and therefore it constituted a boost to my trembly confidence at that point. And therefore, there's no exaggeration to say, it thereby also constituted a aid to my at-homeness in the world at that time. On the other hand, it's 55 years since I entered the classroom of a very different maths teacher. A man with a brilliant mind, but scant emotional resource or subtlety. <laughs> a man better suited to the interrogation room than the classroom. <laughs> a priest who worked, you might say, with more inquisition than mathematician. <laughs> Brodsky's voice was one of the most daring and effective 
affirmative I have known. But perhaps the boldest and most challenging affirmation I ever heard him make was as follows. If art teaches us anything, he used to say, if art teaches us anything, it is that the human condition is private. The human condition is private. I repeat that declaration because I realize I've been emphasizing the private, inward, subjective aspect of the educational experience. What John Keats might have called the schooling of the intelligence until it becomes a soul. And I emphasize this deliberately because subjective experience is obviously an essential factor in the development of an individual's characteristic disposition in his or her readiness to relate adequately, hopefully perhaps affably, to the world. But in talking like this, I am very much aware that I've not been attending to matters which this association is primarily concerned with, representation of the interests of teachers as professionals, advocacy on their behalf at the secondary level, concern for adequate funding, efficient administration, effort on behalf of the staff and students, and so on. I could and should, on this centenary occasion, commend the society, the association's century of uh, achievement, and also its present commitment, especially to equality of access, which has been stressed recently. Access for all students, irrespective of gender, race, religious belief, and so on. Access to equal treatment and opportunity. I could have acknowledged the rightness of the association's opposition to education cutbacks in this era of economic crisis. Spoken of the need in our contemporary situation for more emphasis and value to be placed on the teaching of science subjects. The need to educate for an Ireland that will have to recuperate and fend for itself if it is if it's to survive the present downturn. The need to educate for a social and economic future where we can once again believe in and achieve our best possibilities. All that does indeed warrant affirmation. But that job can be done with more competence and conviction by yourselves and by your guest speaker this morning. I, on the other hand, find myself here, as I tend to find myself in many other places, out of a sense of obligation. Obligation to a cause, in this case the cause of education, education itself. Education which can change the plane of regard for an individual and unleash new potential in his or her life. Education which can furthermore change the tenor of life in a whole society. Years in schools as a student and a teacher, decades in universities and colleges of education have instilled in me a feeling that it is worth <coughs> making pronouncements to this effect, even though I incline more immediately to making more immediately 